Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. One of the initiatives announced under Budget 2022 when it was tabled last Friday was a jobs guarantee initiative called Jamin Kerja. Now, with an allocation of 4.8 billion ringgit, the scheme aims to create uh, 600,000 jobs and is expected to reduce the unemployment rate from 4.6% to 4%. While the initiative has been lauded by many, questions remain over the sustainability and quality of the jobs that will be created. So when it comes to job creation, what should governments do? That's what we'll explore tonight on the show. And our first guest is Cheryl Hamdan, who is the um, Information Chief for AMNO and also recently appointed as Economic Director in the Prime Minister's Office. Cheryl, let's talk about the Jamin Kerja Initiative. I mean, what do you understand to be the thinking behind the Job Guarantee Programme? Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, the, in the, the, the questions about who it's meant for and what kind of jobs that might likely be created. Right. I, I think the thinking behind it uh, is, is really uh, combating unemployment as a key thrust uh, in the recovery plan uh, for COVID uh, or post-COVID. Uh, we've been speaking a lot over the past year and a half about cash aid, and that's always going to be a critical part of our economic policy, fortunately or unfortunately. Uh, but the only way uh, we feel, um, I think, uh, uh, a sustainable path to recovery uh, will be achieved is with two things, really, jobs creation and uh, SMEs or companies uh, um, having their economic activities not uh, curtailed uh, via COVID or lockdowns anymore. So I think this is one of two big elements uh, that uh, informs the philosophy or the thinking of economic policy at this point, at least from my understanding. Uh, Cheryl, can you walk us through some of the details uh, about this? Because we, uh, some of it is linked to uh, hiring within the government sector, within GLCs, and some of it seems to be uh, in supporting biz private businesses to retain their staff or, or to hire people uh, by, you know, giving some portion of the wages, uh, subsidizing some portion of the wages. Could you help us understand uh, how complex this whole endeavor is? Um, it will be complex in its implementation, but I think off the bat I want to say that Jamin Kerja, uh, although it's called Jamin Kerja, uh, from my understanding at least, uh, it's not a job guarantee in a pure theoretical sense, uh, but it's a step in that direction. In the pure theoretical sense, uh, it's meant to be uh, an automatic stabilizer where it becomes a buffer stock of publicly funded uh, stock of em employment opportunities where people who can't find jobs in private sector can come in and out. So that's the conceptual ideal. Uh, but nowhere in this world has it been implemented nationwide. Um, it's been you know, piloted uh, in some form in India with the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Act. Uh, Austria has one town that did it last year. Uh, which, you know, uh, better reflects what I just described, which is basically if you can't find a job, you're guaranteed a job. Jamming Kerja is a step in that direction. It's almost like a distant cousin to the theoretical idea of a job guarantee where government provides X number of jobs. In this case, if I remember correctly, my step will provide 80,000 in 2022. Um, so rather than guaranteeing zero involuntary unemployment, which is what a conceptual job guarantee is meant to do, uh, what... This Jamin Kerja, at least via my step, is guaranteeing that at least 80,000 publicly, fully publicly funded slash GLC funded uh, jobs or positions will be created slash filled. Um, and then the rest of the 600,000 is, as you indicated, Sharad, um, you know, hiring incentives, uh, place and train, or rather train and place um, type of initiatives that also aim to basically put public money uh, into the system and allow for uh, jobs to be created to the tune of 600,000. And it's the first time, in, I think, that a, that a Minister of Finance has spoken in Parliament and basically said that government will guarantee 600,000 people will get jobs. Now, you could argue that without these programs, uh, without the hiring incentives, it's not to say that 
this program is going to give 600,000 jobs that would otherwise not be there. But I think uh, if we're being intellectually honest, a, a big fraction of that 600,000 might not be there if not for uh, this spending that the government is, uh, is putting in. And the other thing, just to quickly add, what's different from my step this year, or rather next year, uh, which is uh, from, from what's been done this year, as, as I understand it, is it's not just that GLCs will hire people for their own company, uh, because that's when people start arguing maybe these are jobs that are not really necessary, these are, these are just to fill in um, quotas or KPIs. I think what we've seen with Kazana especially, and a lot of credit goes to them, uh, what they did this year, as I understand it, was they funded it, but they placed these individuals in out-of-town SMEs, rather out-of-KL SMEs, uh, into jobs that wasn't Kazana jobs, but jobs in companies that Kazana paid for. Now imagine to a broader or longer logical conclusion, you could say then, therefore, that not just government creates jobs for government agencies, but government slash GLCs can fund these jobs for more community work, for NGOs that you know, uh, presumably do social type uh, 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 work that wouldn't be created by the private sector itself. So that's when the distant cousin becomes less of a distant cousin. Okay, well, well, you answered my, my question about what kind of jobs are being created. Now, I had wanted you to address some of the uh, concerns that had been brought up that perhaps some of these jobs were artificially created jobs, jobs that might not be sustainable or productive, uh, particularly in the long run. And I like that you said, you know, the thinking is, um, well, if you want, if you if you can't find a job and you want a job, then the government guarantees a job. Can I ask you, Shari, I mean, this thinking has been implemented, has so certain initiatives have been introduced in several other budgets previously as well. I think last year there was a National Employment Council set up, half a million jobs was promised or, or aimed to be achieved. I mean, is someone monitoring that? Were those jobs created? And um, uh, is this 600,000 jobs for the same people that the same type of jobs that were created last year. I'm just wondering whether there's been monitoring and kind of a continuity in terms of the initiatives that have been announced, particularly in addressing job creation and unemployment. I think that's a really good question. And whatever happened last year or this year, I think next year what everybody would like to see is more transparent reporting on behalf of the government. And when the Minister of Finance in Parliament says that he guarantees, or the government guarantees 600,000 uh, people will get jobs via this program, uh, then I think he's on a hook for uh, reporting it. Um, I don't know what the reporting mechanism will be, but I think uh, people will expect some sort of update or status report uh, that, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't so forthcoming this year. So maybe that can be one of the positive changes this time around. Uh, second thing uh, about your question about um, what kind of jobs, uh, which also should be part of those reports, right? Um, that's when I hinted in my in my previous answer. Kalau boleh, if possible, it's not just, you know, GLC saying, right, I'll just hire a bunch of people, put it in my HQ office, which, by the way, is a problem because most of them are in KL. Uh, but rather, GLC saying and government saying, if if the stats department don't need more people, if Jabatan Kebajikan don't need more people, uh, we will allow for, for example, uh, NGOs, because I, I, I think that would be a great thing, uh, NGOs to do community work, uh, to do, who do environmental work, for example, in, 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 in a ground sense, uh, we will fund, uh, we will fund uh, those initiatives possibly as part of those uh, jobs that we speak of. So this is not, not government policy. I'm not speaking on behalf of government, but I think that could be one push uh, where we try and convince people, the doubters who say these are artificially created jobs, uh, because it's a loaded term, right? Artificially created jobs basically saying that these jobs are not necessary or not needed. Uh, if we can show that it's not just private sector uh... Sorry, Cheryl, if I could just jump in there oh, uh, with, with the question of, uh, have we lost Cheryl? Melissa? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I think we have, um, but let's try and get oh. him back and uh, and see if we can Yes, so unfortunately we've, we've lost Shari, so we're going to take a quick break and we will try and get him back 
or we will um, speak to another economist and uh, we'll continue this conversation about the government's role in creating jobs, particularly as announced under Budget 2022 with the initiative Jamin Kerja. Stay tuned to consider this. We'll be right back. dan semangat menjadi kesinambungan perpaduan tanah air yang tercinta berteraskan adab yang terpahat di jiwa dan raga marilah bersama kita membina negara Malaysia untuk memastikan Malaysia ada ke depan kita boleh maju induknya adalah Melayu Malik itu kepada sesuatu yang membuat polisi kalau itu yang dia nak ki, fine. Hi, welcome back to Consider This. I'm Lissette Chris with me, Sharad Kutin. We've got Sharil Hamdan back on the line, Information Chief for UMNO, recently appointed Economic Director uh, in the Prime Minister's Office. Sharad, you had a question for Sharil. Yes, uh, Sharil, look, you were kind of explaining what um, the thinking is behind this. I, I wonder if there's a long-term analysis about jobs uh, and where jobs are going to be created as the Malaysian economy evolves. This particular scheme, is it really about just addressing uh, the current uh, shortfall in jobs uh, with the expectation that uh, the, the market that's been driving job creation for decades now is going to, uh, you know, come back in a way that will be consistent with, you know, aspirations that people have about uh, you know, wage levels and such. Is that or is there a kind of concession or a kind of resignation that Malaysia might actually be entering to a phase where the market no longer can support the kind of aspirations people have and government's going to have to somehow subsidize that? So I'm going to try and make this simple as, as possible. Um, I think uh, there's truth in, well, I wouldn't say this is a concession of any sort. Um, when it comes to saying that the market, we've given up on the market. Uh, the market will always be the main driver of jobs and, and as long as we live in this kind of system, that has to be the truth uh, and we've got to make it work. So the problems around uh, wage suppression, and the problems around underemployment, that is not going to be solved by Jamin Kerja or any type of uh, job guarantee program on its own. Uh, this is both... Uh, uh, not a stopgap measure, but a recognition of where we are at this particular moment in time. Uh, but I'd like to think that this is also an opportunity uh, to think outside the box or really challenge policymakers uh, to start realizing that however gangbusters our economy is at any point in the future, there will always be unemployment. And uh, can we begin to think of this as an automatic stabilizer? Uh, so, so you know, I, I know we were trying to, you know push me in a particular uh, uh, direction with regards to whether uh, this is our answer to, you know, low wages and the fact that there's a there's, there's, uh, big unemployment problem in this country. It's not the only answer. And we will have to do more challenging, more bold things when it comes to uh, ensuring that the private sector can create the kind of high income jobs that we always speak of, we've been speaking about for the past decade. And that's about competitiveness, that's about our policies, that's about our investment, uh, our FDI policies, what kind of FDI we attract, all the rest of it. So that still has to carry on, and that's, that's perhaps a more difficult conversation. But even if we succeed with that, even if we create you know, uh, median wages 2x, 3x from where, where we are right now, there will always be unemployment. And where I come in, at least in this particular ideological uh, conversation, is to say that maybe government always has to step in. And even if our unemployment is at 300,000 versus 750 today, we still got to figure out what to do with 300,000. 
and uh, uh, the thinking right now globally, I think, more and more people are starting to question if, uh, in, you know, full employment has to mean 2% unemployment. Think about that, Sharad and Melissa. We've always been taught right. that full employment still means that a bunch of people are unemployed. And I think that is uh, that is something that the job guarantee conceptually, and Jamin Kerja is a baby step towards that, uh, can begin to challenge. But to your to your original question, no, this does not solve the competitiveness problem. This doesn't solve the, the more you know, deeper structural problems, uh, but uh, it serves a particular purpose in time. All right, Shara, thank you. We will definitely consider that. Um, we'll take a quick break now, but that was uh, information Chief for Amna Sharil Hamdan. We're going to take a quick break, but we'll come back and speak to a World Bank economist of this, particularly about the Jobs Guarantee Program. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Kesinambungan perpaduan tanah air yang tercinta, berteraskan adab yang terpahat di jiwa dan raga. Marilah bersama kita membina negara Malaysia. Untuk memastikan Malaysia ke kedepan dan maju, induknya adalah melayu Malik dan Malaysia. Orang yang membuat polisi. Kalau itu yang dia nak ki, fine. Mungkin kita berbeza pandangan. Tapi kita mem- Hi, thanks so much for staying with Shraj and I. I'll consider this. However, if you've just joined us on the show tonight, we're zooming in on one of the initiatives announced under Budget 2022, the Jamin Kerja Job Placement, a Job Guarantee Scheme, which is aimed at creating some 600,000 jobs. When it comes to job creation, what should governments do? Joining us on the line now is Shakira Tesharifuddin. She's a senior economist at the World Bank. Um, Shakira, what are your thoughts on, um, you know, not just this German Persia initiative that was recently announced, but I'm just wondering also overall in terms of how uh, government is addressing job creation and unemployment in this budget? Thanks, Sharia and Melissa for having me tonight. Um, I think maybe I'll start uh, with a broader overview and things in terms of you know our quick takes on the budget in general before we move into jobs. So I think first thing it's it's great that this budget is cognizant and that it's aware that this is a budget um, for a cautious recovery period. And as such, you see many of the support measures, including you know uh, various um, employment measures such as the Jamie Kerja Initiative, the wage subsidies, various financial in- incentives are still in place. And that's good to know because you don't want to preemptively uh, wind down some of these measures, uh, given the uh, uncertainty that we're seeing right now. Um, and then on related to that is there is an attempt or more visibility in terms of making the budget more inclusive. And so you see a recognition in addressing lagging regions such as Sabah, Sarawak, as well as lagging states. Uh, in peninsula and also related to jobs and as we move on later is there is also the recognition um, to provide additional support to vulnerable groups such as Orang Asli, the OKU, senior citizens and children. And, and finally before again we, we discuss a bit further on the, on, on, the, on the employment market is of course there is a bigger and deliberate emphasis on women and includes measures to encourage women to return to the labor force, provision of childcare, for example, as well as personal hygiene kits um, for women. So moving into an em- uh, employment measures or the Jamie Kerja Initiative, I think broadly it is a more comprehensive measure than you know the initial wage subsidy program that we saw in the previous stimulus packages in that um, it covers also upskilling uh, and training opportunities. So it's aimed 
at this particular budget um, at certain groups of workers. So you see those who have been unemployed for a certain amount of time, women, um, again, um, some vulnerable groups, including the disabled and orang asli, are sort of targeted um, as part of this Jami Kerja initiative. And so broadly, I think wage subsidies can be an important tool um, for supporting an employment and re-employment during this period of recovery by reducing the cost of hiring workers for businesses. So what we've seen so far is that during the crisis, um, the wage subsidy program that was previously introduced do provide some relief for firms to sort of support the retention of workers. But of course, we do see a higher number of unemployment taking place, particularly um, for those employed by the SMEs, despite the wage subsidies. Um, I think Shapira, uh, if yes. I can jump in, can I? Sorry, can I ask you? Uh, one of the things that we seem to uh, uh, notice during the periods of lockdown, the long uh, and very painful lockdowns, was that it affected people in the informal sector. You know, those people who make a living basically from day to day, uh, uh, often depending on footfall in order to uh, to ply their wares. Where do they fit into the image that government seems to have about the unemployed? Are these people who used to have jobs, work for somebody else, pay EPF, maybe have a university degree or whatever it is? Is that the image that the government has of the unemployed? Or is it those pers that person selling Goring Pisang who's been under tr tremendous pressure over the last year and a half? I think it cuts across several groups, particularly during this crisis. So as you said, Sharad, um, the informal workers were you know, one of the sort of more severely affected groups as a result of the pandemic. But at the same time, we saw, for example, under underemployment um, increase, and that has been sort of on an upward trend even prior to the pandemic. So those were affected groups as well. And I think um, what's key here is that they were, I mean, the government recognized this and that was sort of supported by uh, some of the uh, cash assistance and transfer, as transfer measures that they introduced. So there is a recognition that there are certain groups within you know, the whole gamut of the labor market that were more affected than the others. So for example, I think we put out a study um, by some of our colleagues, those in the agriculture sector, for example, um, unable to work from home and they are more affected by the pandemic than say, for example, the, your typical office workers. So yes, there are sort of differentiation within the labor market segment. Right. And when you, uh, you know, uh, bear that in mind, thinking about the kind of Jamin Kerja uh, initiative, how would this initiative, how, what, what kind of shape and form would you like this initiative uh, to, to take in order to address the multidimensional labour market, in order to address the different regions that, um, you know, in the, the ways uh, unemployment and underemployment affect in different regions? How should this, uh, what, what do you think it would take for this initiative to be truly effective to address the current unemployment situation? Well, in terms of, you know, labor market measures, I think, and as well as with social protection measures, these are best if they are well targeted and carefully implemented. So, I mean, take for example, the My Step program, which is a temporary em uh, employment program. So if it's targeted well, for example, to fresh graduates, it may provide them with the job experience that they need in order to move on to better jobs later. So um, it depends, again, it's, it has to be well targeted and I think the implementation is key. So if there is a mention of, you know, this various initiatives could lead to creation of about 600,000 jobs. But of course, the implementation, when it comes to, you know, applying the, tr the transaction costs, um, for anybody to, to, to join some of these initiatives have to be low in order for them to sort of in, in incentivize or take up some of these initiatives uh, at the same time. Um, I think monitoring uh, the, impl uh, the implementation and uh, um, both in the short term and the long term of these initiatives are also important in order to sort of like provide some information in order um, for the program to be more flexible if, if there are any such uh, big changes happening in the economy. So can, can we pick up on that point of monitoring? Because we asked the previous guest, Sharal Hamdan, about uh, previous promises also to create jobs and what seems to be a lack of data on whether 
any of those provinces were fulfilled, whether uh, and what the impact was, long term, short term, things that you mentioned about this being a stepping stone to something better. Is that something just uh, an aspiration of government rather than a reality on the ground? What in, in the experience of the World Bank, does the Malaysian government collect enough data so that we can evidence based policy making that, you know, can be tweaked and, and, and uh, uh, can evolve as we understand the, the consequences of those policies? Is there any enough data? Well, I think there are two parts to that question. So first of all, I think, um, yes, it should be better monitoring um, of the situation. And it's through better implementation as well as better collection of data. And I think in terms of data, um, the, the information is out there. I think what can be improved um, by, um, in, in, by the government is, of course, um, a better data ecosystem, in which case I think data uh, information is better shared across ministries and across agencies. So fragmentation is something that is quite um, common to see in, 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 a, in, in public sector. So um, it's not that we don't have data. In my opinion, I think what is more important is to have uh, to improve the governance and the coordination across ministries and agencies who are monitoring um, the situation on the ground. Right. Shekhar, can I ask you, I mean, uh, a lot of people have pointed out that, you know, these uh, job initiatives or these types of job initiatives, particularly announced in budget, and at this time, um, is a, a short term measure. But un unemployment, underemployment is something that Malaysia has been grappling with for long before the pandemic um, struck. And I'm just wondering what kind, whether you saw any kind of structural um, uh, initi initiatives that were meant to address some of the structural problems around employment um, and what you would like to see partic in particular as we come out of this, as we are you know, dealing with kind of some of the short term initiatives, what you would like to see be addressed for the long term, um, you know, uh, uh, to address the long term issues of underemployment and unemployment? Sure, I think as we all know, the budget is a one year document, so it's more short term in nature. But I think what we hope to see over the medium term and the long term is first, I think there's always this talk about um, creating high value jobs, high skilled jobs in the market. And one of the things I think um, the government is thinking about this is through uh, its investment policy. So basically attracting more quality investments into the country, which can provide um, high skilled jobs that, you know, it's much talked about um, going forward. Um, but I think it also has to be complemented with um, this discussion of creating jobs should be complemented with uh, talks about protecting, um, uh, increasing social protection or improving social protection and at the same time protecting uh, workers' welfare. And I think even more long term is in terms of human capital development in this country. So I think we came out with a report, I think a couple of years back, um, saying that for Malaysia to have a productive workforce, it has to concentrate on two things. One is, of course, in terms of education. And there, there's, 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 there's definitely gaps for Malaysia. I think there's a learning gap of three years. So basically, children in Malaysia go to school for about 12 years. And then, but the learning amount of learning that they get is only for about nine years. So that has to be improved in order to have that skilled workforce. And then secondly, in terms of the health uh, measures as well. So Malaysia has, one of, uh, has quite a high stunting rate that cuts across all income levels. So that has to be sort of addressed and improved as well, because you want to have, again, not just the, 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 um, a skilled workforce, but also a, a productive and healthy workforce going forward. So I think those are some of the you know, more long term and medium term takes when it comes to uh, uh, employment. So what we see in the budget is, of course, um, it's again, it's for one year. We'll probably see uh, more initiatives going forward. But I think these are some of the issues that has to be tackled now um, for long term uh, outcomes. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Shakira, for joining us on the show. Shakira Teshaifuddin from the World Bank. That's all we have for you on this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin, signing off the evening. Thank you so much for watching and good night. <laughs>